In today's form report, the first case of the highly pathogenic avian influenza has been detected in Indiana late last week. Rod Bain with the U.S. Department of Agriculture has more on the USDA response. Since the outbreak last year and all the lessons learned from that, there's been a lot of good work to increase our preparatory efforts at the federal side, the state side, and the industry side. Now Associate Deputy Administrator of USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, T.J. Myers, and others are putting those preparatory efforts to practice. With the recent announcement of the first case of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the U.S. this year, discovered in a commercial turkey flock in Indiana. That state's veterinarian, Brett Marsh, says once the case was discovered, communication started immediately. We've been in communication with the surrounding states, as well as, frankly, every state in the nation on a national call so that all states are aware to alert them because we realize that if it's indeed a wild bird origin, they know no boundaries. So we want to make sure that everyone is properly informed of what our experience is, and therefore they can, with a heightened sense of awareness, share that with their industry partners. Of note, a new strain of high path AI was found at the infected site. An H7N8 highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. This is a different strain of virus than the strains that we saw during the 2015 outbreak, which were primarily H5 influenza viruses. Leading to epidemiological investigators and ground crews looking for the origin of this virus. Indiana State Veterinarian Brett Marsh said, I suspect we will find similar to what was the case last year to find that one thing that caused it may be very difficult. Meanwhile, samples from the infected facility have been collected and placed in virus isolation to determine more information on the gene segments to this strain of high path AI. On the biosecurity front, the infected site was placed under quarantine. The population of the infected flock occurred immediately. Also, we have established, as is protocol, a control zone in a 10-kilometer area around the affected site so that products that move in and out of that area are moving under permit and are identified as coming from negative sites. A protocol established by federal, state, and industry partners in the event of a highly pathogenic avian influenza event. And as APHIS Associate Deputy Administrator T.J. Myers added, That surveillance in that 10-kilometer area around the index case is going to be absolutely critical over the next few days. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. A USDA microloan program has been expanded, now covering more types of investments for both new and smaller farmers and ranchers, including real estate purchases and other building construction projects, according to Farm Service Agency Administrator Val Docevi. FSA administers microloan programs, including the Direct Farm Ownership Microloan Program, which announced its expanded coverage Tuesday. The loans provide up to $50,000 to new farmers, niche, or traditional operations. Perhaps you needed to buy irrigation supplies or feed or fuel or use tractor or panel truck, something to help you get your crops to market. Those were loans of up to $50,000, and to date we've made almost 17,000 of them. More information about microloans and loan applications are available at local FSA offices or go online for more details at www.fsa.usda.gov slash microloans. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Soil health is important for all crop producers. Dan Martins with the University of Minnesota Extension Service Office share some details and highlights from a recent workshop that he attended. I'll share some information today from notes I took while attending the Crop Pest Short Course back in December conducted by U of M Extension and the Minnesota Crop Production Retailers Association. Dr. Deb Allen, who recently retired from U of M Soil Science Department, talked about soil health. She defines soil health as how fit the soil is to do what it's meant to do. If soil in a field is meant to grow a crop, then how good of shape is it in for supporting a crop? That might have to do with physical conditions related to good root development, suitable drainage, while still holding adequate water and nutrients for the crop. Soil health for a forest, a cornfield, an alfalfa field, the banks of a manure storage basin will have somewhat different parameters. Soil scientists like to come up with quality indicators. The rest of us also need a way to quantify and talk about various characteristics of the soil that matter in given situations. This might have to do with soil biology, soil chemistry, soil physical characteristics, and other things. 
Deb made reference to an online soil health manual and assessment tool from Cornell University. One tool is a seven-day anaerobic incubation test to evaluate the soil for active carbon. It's meant to give an indication of soil organic matter and other biological organisms in the soil. One of the soil health tests we read about commonly is the Solvita test. This is basically a 24-hour incubation test where microbial activity is supposed to indicate the potential for carbon and nitrogen mineralization. The test provides real information. The question is, can we use the information to improve decision made about the amount of supplemental nitrogen or other crop nutrients needed by the crop? Are the results repeatable and consistent for being reliable for making specific decisions? People working with this test have found that the results are affected by how wet the soil is. That seems logical. Then it's important to figure out how to dry or wet the soil correctly in the lab, depending on whether it's a more sandy soil, loamy soil, or clay soil. Deb said the organic matter content of the soil is still really a better predictor of nitrogen that can be mineralized from the soil related to nitrogen recommendations. For the Solvita test, more work needs to be done to improve lab procedures and even more field trials need to be done to correlate Solvita test results to crop response in the field related to some specific management decisions. Deb also talked about the Haney test, which is supposed to be a microbial activity indicator. From Deb's discussion, the Haney tests sound like a long formula that applies weighted factors to a wide variety of tests that are run on the soil. Perhaps even more than the Solvita test, the Haney test lacks field trials that provide a reliable correlation between test results and the decisions that you make about management practices in the field. So it sounds like there's plenty to learn before you bet the farm. And it's important with any test or recommendation process to apply your common sense and experience to the situation. I sometimes call that being a good student of your farm. I'm Dan Martins with U of M Extension. U.S. dairies may produce 211.8 billion pounds of milk this year. And that's a record milk production. About 1.5% more than last year, but of course, USDA Outlook Chairman Seth Meyer says with a little bit more milk output. So a little bit of a lower expectation for milk prices. In fact, Meyer says price prospects now are even lower than had been projected just a month ago. We did make some adjustments this month, and the softening uh, milk price softened it about 60 cents. And that's giving us an all-milk price of $15.70. Cents. Down a dollar thirty-three from 2015, and naturally, depending on demand and feed prices, this may trim margins a little bit. But he says not by that much. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Get the latest in farm news at fallsradio.com. Also at fallsradio.com, you can like us on Facebook. Search for Little Falls Radio Ag.